Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Mascaram Gabagdabe, Assistant Clinical Professor and the Director of Inclusion and Community Engagement in the School of Human Evolution, Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. I feel incredibly privileged to be able to bring, uh, to provide timely and important programming such as today's lecture, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, welcome to the second talk of the semester in our colloquium series titled Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis with our 11th lecture to date. This uh, monthly series aims to highlight the work of contemporary scholars belonging to identities and traditions marginalized within mainstream Western academia who, through their work, confront neo-colonial power structures and challenge long-standing norms of, of knowledge production. It was born out of a demand from our graduate students for exposure to more critical scholarship that is relevant to their lived experiences and the times in which we are living. Um, specifically, I want to thank Nalu Vega Ross, Tisa Lowen, Aliyah Hoff, and Dr. Anais Roque, who uh, worked with me to conceptualize this series and to establish its, its parameters. I also want to thank all of the staff members who have and are helping behind the scenes to make this event happen, uh, Nicole Pomerant, Kristen Walton, Bobby Johnson, and um, as well as Alice. Um, I also want to acknowledge CHESC leadership for supporting and sponsoring this series, specifically our unit director, Dr. Chris Dojanowski, who is here with us today. And we um, and I also want to let you all know that we have one more talk in the series this semester, Dr. Jonathan Rosa on April 28th. So keep an eye out in the coming weeks for more information on that talk. Um, before I introduce our speaker today, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note that today's talk is being recorded. You, the audience, will not be visible in the recording. Um, we will be leaving time for questions after the talk, and we are asking that you write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to vocalize the question yourself rather than have me read it out, please write ask live in parentheses at the end of the question you submit using the Q&A button. And then I will call on you and unmute your mic so that you may do so. Um, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Keisha Supernaut. Dr. Supernaut um, is the director of the Institute, Institute of Prairie and Indig Indigenous Archaeology and an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Alberta. An award-winning teacher, researcher, and writer, her research in interests include the relationship between cultural identities, landscapes, and the use of space. Um, Matisse archaeology, and heart-centered archaeological practice. Her research with Indigenous communities, includes, including Matisse and First Nations, and Western Canada explores how archaeologists and communities can build collaborative research relationships. She leads the Exploring Matisse Identity Through Archaeology, EMITA, a, a, collective, uh, a collaborative research project which takes a relational approach to exploring the material past of Matisse communities, including her own family in Western Canada. Recently, she has been increasingly engaged in using remote sensing technologies to locate and protect unmarked burials, including around Indian residential schools at the request of First Nation communities in Alberta and Saskatchewan. She has published in local and international journals on GIS and archaeology, collaborative archaeological practice, Matisse archaeology, and indigenous archaeology in, in the post-TRC era. She was recently elected to the Royal Society of Canada's new College of Scholars, Scientists, and Artists. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Keisha Supernath. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm really uh, pleased to be with you all here today. And Tanse, Kisha Supernanitsi Katsan, Amiskuchi Wiskaigan of Chinia, the Machifnia. Hello, everyone. I'm coming to you today from Amiskuchi uh, Wiskaigan, which is the Cree word for the city of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. It's also the home of Treaty Six Nations and the Metis homeland, including a lot of members of my own family. 
I'm here today to talk a little bit about my research and the types of work that I'm currently engaged in. And I framed it very much around the relationships between archaeology, Indigenous knowledge, and restorative justice. And we'll draw upon a number of different examples from my own work, including work on Métis archaeology from the Amita Project, and then working with nations to find uh, unmarked graves in a variety of contexts, which of course is a very pressing issue right now. But I want to start from a bigger place. I want to start from a really fundamental question that we ask, which is what is archaeology and who is it for? I've been reflecting on this question, as many of us, uh, you know, we're trained in archaeology in a particular kind of way to imagine what it is and, and what it should be, who it's for. I certainly was very much trained in the fact that archaeology was using material to study the past, but very much that archaeologists were stewards of the past for kind of the good of all, that it was our job to translate the materials of the past into stories in the present and to teach others about those pasts. It wasn't until later on in my university training that the questions around ethics and the relationships that non-archaeologists, particularly descendant communities, had with the archaeological record became in the forefront of our conversations. This was around, you know, the early 2000s when I was in my undergrad and in my graduate work, and this question continued to kind of grow for me. It also had me reflecting on what a number of archaeologists I think have been reflecting on, especially those who work with Indigenous communities and work on Indigenous pasts, which is what has been archaeology's role in colonial contexts? What is the relationship between the work of archaeology and the, the work of sort of settler colonial states? Very much, there's a lot of connection here between a number of, of core concepts. Archaeology has been, and in many cases, continue, continues to be extractive. This is both physically extractive, we do excavations, we take materials out of the ground, but also extractive in terms of knowledge. Many archaeologists who work in North America, for example, work on Indigenous histories, often you know, working in these places, taking knowledge from what is learned, and there's varying ways in which different archaeologists work with Indigenous communities. Some work very closely, others not as much. The foundational ideas in archaeology are strongly related to colonization. This idea that you have folks who aren't from these lands coming in with knowledge systems, with particular ways of understanding, and then imposing them on those histories and on those lands. And archaeology has often been very tied up with that colonial project, and it has led to a diminishing of the understanding of the richness of histories outside of those sort of colonial places. And it also has tended to create frameworks around, for example, progressions, uh, social and cultural evolution, that tends to put societies from other places lower on some sort of evolutionary ladder of civilization. And we see a lot of pushback against these models, which are not even supported by the data that we have. Archaeology is fundamentally the use of the scientific method to understand materials in the past. Many of us were very trained in, in a way to you know, test hypotheses and generate data, but this emerges out of really a Western way of knowing and specifically uh, particular ideas around science as the only true valid way to understand the past, even though of course archaeology is an inherently ambiguous subject even when you're using science. There's many things that we don't possibly know, but when we do archaeology, we're trained to center particular ways of categorizing, particular ways of generating knowledge that often aren't reflect, reflective of the people who left behind these materials that we study. And of course, archaeology remains a, a discipline that does not often make good space for different sorts of voices. In a recent survey of archaeologists in Canada, for example, we know that 77% or so are from uh, you know, Western European backgrounds. Many of them, you know, growing up and, and living in Canada uh, for many generations, but not Indigenous peoples from those lands and not also other historically excluded voices. This is challenged in a number of ways. Certainly within archaeology, we're having these conversations. I think there's broader social co conversations in the social sciences and beyond around this. 
But I'm really interested in the ways in which archaeology can actually shift and change in response to recognizing the kind of colonial underpinnings of a lot of the work and the fact that it has been very extractive, both of knowledge and belongings and ancestors. And I want to take us back then to something really fundamental, which is Indigenous rights as human rights. We see the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This declaration has very clear implications for archaeology on Indigenous lands and histories. Specifically, UNDRIP talks about two core articles that relate to archaeology. Article 11 talks specifically about the right to maintain, protect, and develop past, present, and future manifestations of their cultures, archaeological sites, historical sites, artifacts, designs, ceremonies, etc., and that states need to develop redress for what has been taken and for how these rights have not been upheld. The second article is Article 12, which more specifically relates to religious ceremonies and beliefs and customs, as well as the way that Indigenous peoples wish to treat their ancestors, in particular the repatriation of human remains, and that states should seek redress for the taking of many Indigenous ancestors and placing them into institutions and museums. So if we take this fundamental idea that Indigenous rights are human rights, and that Indigenous rights include rights to cultural heritage, which many archaeologists study, then it asks us to change the ways in which we approach that study, not to abandon it entirely, but to imagine different ways to do archaeology. And this brings me to what it, would it mean to do an archaeology that rather would than focusing on reproducing those sort of colonial structures to one that really focuses on that redress and restorative justice. There are a number of archaeologists from different communities, Indigenous archaeologists, Black archaeologists, queer archaeologists, archaeologists with disabilities, who are turning their lens to this question of redress and restorative justice. What does this look like? Well, an archaeology of restorative justice seeks redress for historical and ongoing wrongs. This can be both in the design of new sorts of projects to explore places where these wrongs were perpetuated. It can also be addressing the rights of Indigenous peoples or other descendant groups to the materials that have been taken. Uh, and also sometimes even going back into previous archaeology, how things have been interpreted what are the logics that are being used and providing alternative ways to understand those same data sets. It's also the use of archaeological techniques. You know, archaeology does tend to draw on some very strong and solid methods out of science. There's things that we can learn through archaeology that are very powerful, but this is asking for a reorientation to say what would the community like to know and how can archaeology potentially test to see if we can learn about that using archaeological methods. It doesn't guarantee particular outcomes, but it does help us generate new questions and new hypotheses and imagine new ways of doing archaeology itself. It also is a focus on using archaeological knowledge to support calls for justice. This could mean, you know, anything from working on the Tulsa race massacre site using ground penetrating radar and archaeological techniques to help support that. Uh, and there's a whole variety of ways in which this could be done, but the eye to this is very much one of, of justice. It's also inviting an expansion in the different ways in which we narrate the past because even the most sort of staunch archaeologists were always telling a particular narrative, whether it's based on science exclusively, whether it's based on multiple ways of knowing, we're always creating a narrative, creating an understanding of the past. And this invites multiple ways of doing that, that there's more than one valid way of knowing, there's more than one valid way of understanding the past. And in fact, when we make more space for those, we don't place one narrative over another that you actually create a much richer understanding of the past. And then the other focus here is really on undoing histories of harm and extraction, returning belongings, returning ancestors, should that be what communities wish, opening up the conversations about what do we do with this giant amount of data that has already been extracted, much of which is sitting in warehouses and boxes and not even being engaged with. So how can we explore ways to move forward that uh, address that history? A lot of the focus we've seen 
in the last number of years is very much in, importantly very critical of what archaeology has been. And one of the things that I've been reflecting on with a number of, of colleagues and other scholars is how do we move forward in a way that reorients archaeology and invites some new ways of doing it moving forward for everyone who does archaeology. This is partly what led to the development of this book, Archaeologies of the Heart, which was co-edited by myself, Jane Baxter, Natasha Lyons, and Sonia Adelaide, and contains chapters from uh, a number of different places and tells different ways of, of doing archaeology based on four core, what we call chambers of heart-centered archaeology. I'm just going to really briefly run through these because they are at the heart of the type of archaeology that I do. And they inform a lot of my, my research practice and my teaching practice, the way I work with colleagues and mentors, the way I work with community. So the first chamber to archaeologies of the heart is care. Everything comes from this place of care. And this is everything from care for the materials and landscapes that we have the privilege of studying, caring for uh, other archaeologists, building environments that are less based on competition and more based on collaboration, where we create safer environments for archaeologists to practice, because archaeology is not the safest place for many people. And that ethic of care really then also informs um, how we connect to the past. So how we make sense of, of the people who left behind these materials for us to try to understand. Care invites also a better understanding of the relationship between emotion and the material past that we study. Emotion is not a subject that is often included in our archaeological work. There is definitely some work that has come before us that has, but it has been more the kind of conversations you have uh, at the meal after the conference session and maybe not part of the conference uh, paper itself, or that you have around the campfire when you're out in the field about how certain places, certain belongings, certain materials have affect. They have a response, a human response. Uh, and it, so this is inviting the sense that we can understand the role of emotion in what it means to be fundamentally to be human, that we are all whole people who have hearts as well as minds, and that when we allow space to understand that emotion, that it actually also enriches our practice and allows us to understand our biases and where we're coming from. And it also allows us to understand that emotion has likely long been a part of human decision making. So uh, this idea that people in the past were also emotional, they may not have had the same emotional connection that we do, we can't assume that people in the past were exactly engaging exactly like we are, but that we can recognize there were emotions and emotional connections. The third chamber of archaeologies of the heart is relation. Now we've seen the rise of conversations about you know relationality and relational ontology in archaeology relation of course is also at the core of many indigenous knowledge systems many indigenous ontologies a very different understanding of the interrelated nature of the world so for us relation is core both in how we relate to each other in the present and then how we understand relations in the past creating more space for those interconnected ways of understanding the world, that it's not just about the particular categories you put things in, but in fact, it's in those connections where a lot can be understood and learned. And then also respecting the relations that other people might have to those pasts, working with the Senate communities, working with Indigenous communities, respecting that their engagement with those materials, belongings, ancestors, places, may be different than the archaeologists, but that are equally valid and need to be respected and understood. And then the fourth chamber is rigor. We wanted to bring rigor into the core of this for a few reasons. One is there's often been a critique of, you know, having too much subjectivity, too much emotion, too much care is somehow not rigorous. And my response to that always is, you know, every knowledge system has internal rigor. It has understandings of how knowledge is generated, what constitutes knowledge, who holds knowledge, and how that knowledge is passed on. And 
there's no such thing as complete objectivity as a human being. We always have connections, there's other things happening. We are not merely minds. And so to be rigorous is to understand one's bias, is to understand that we all bring perspectives and standpoints to the work and to be explicit about what those are. I would also say that for me, being rigorous means being extremely attentive to the ways in which I use the scientific method. So I want to use the best possible forms of science in order to explore the questions that uh, communities are interested in, but I'm also not going to uh, provide information that is not reflected by the outcomes. I'm not going to go out and tell someone the, uh, about a result that isn't actually represented in the information that I have, because that would be deeply unethical to the relations that I have as well. So I always say caring about this work means I am absolutely committed to doing the best possible science, not overstating the results, not creating false confidence when we don't actually know many things using archaeological methods. So these are our four chambers of the heart, and a lot of my work really uh, attends to these different uh, chambers. But of course, as an Indigenous scholar, as someone who is deeply connected to the lands in which I live and work, it also really focuses on um, Indigenous knowledges within this. So I want to talk a little bit about the restorative justice and archaeologies of the heart by walking you through two core examples. The first example is my Amiti archaeological project, the Amita project, and how this both challenges those questions of knowledge and how knowledge is created within archaeology, but also how it tends to connect to my own relations and to my own care um, around the past. So recognizing that you know, many of you probably are uh, from the US and may not have as much familiarity, I'm Métis and what that means in Canada is that we are a recognized Indigenous community, one of the three Aboriginal peoples as the Constitution claims us, uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit. There has tended to be a misconception that being Métis means having Indigenous and non-Indigenous ancestry, but in fact it is much, much more than that. It is a way of life, it is a culture, we have a particular history and language and you know, ways of dress and ways of living that are unique, that are distinct. And so we are a people and a nation, not just someone with a great grandmother who's Indigenous. We, my family was Indigenous, for gen, was Métis for generations. And for me, this work is very much also about reclaiming my own family's connections. I have two images up here for you. This is my great great grandparents. Uh, so they were both born in Alberta in the later part of the 19th century and uh, had a very large family. And so therefore I have many, many living cousins. Both are Métis and they, their children married into other Métis families. Both of their parents on both sides are Métis grandparents, both side Métis, you have to go several generations back to find a non-Indigenous person on those family trees. Another connection I have here is Louise Gladjew, um, who is my three times great-grandmother. She was Papa's Chase Cree. It's a First Nation that is no longer federally recognized, but originally was supposed to have a reserve, which is what we call reservations here in Canada, um, here in the city of Edmonton itself. So long connections to this place. And she took Métis Scrip, which was a system used by the Canadian government to dispossess Métis people after we had twice uh, resisted Canadian domination, which I'll get into more a little bit. The Métis Scrip has become an important marker for people connecting to the Métis nation and to our history. So as I mentioned, there has been this misconception of sort of Métis being mixed, and obviously the term originally comes from the French term, but it did come to stand for a distinct nation. Uh, originally, it did certainly stem from, you know, country marriages, as they were called at the time, between European fur traders and Indigenous women, uh, primarily, but not exclusively, Cree and Ojibwe, and then their children married children from similar unions, which is exactly what happened to my family. I think it's like five times great grandparents on most lines are where the last uh, European fur trader was and then deeply interconnected uh, kin relations within Métis communities after that point. So we are much more than just 
someone with a, a long ago indigenous ancestor. This was a way of life and a, a culture and a nation. Our nation really emerged from the dynamics of the fur trade. We played important roles in connecting the fur traders with local indigenous communities, acting as provisioners, acting as guides, uh, moving goods and services all through these large and vast areas. So our homeland is quite large and includes a good chunk of kind of the middle of Canada, as well as down into the US, into Minnesota, North Dakota, and Montana. And um, in 1816, outside of, uh, Red River, which is now Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, we raised a flag declaring ourselves the new nation in the West. And then when the Dominion of Canada started in 1867, uh, they attempted to assert dominion over the Métis uh, homeland and Métis resisted. Uh, resisted once in 1869, which led to a settlement uh, agreement that resulted in the province of Manitoba being established. And then when Canada wasn't upholding that 15 years later, uh, we resisted again. And in that resistance, we're quite soundly defeated and our leader, Louis Riel, who's right in the middle of this photo here, was hung as a traitor. He's now been sort of reinvented as a hero in Canada, which is sort of an interesting uh, history. After this, we were largely dispossessed without a land base. Many uh, road allowance communities emerged where because Métis families had nowhere to live, they would build sort of towns on these areas set aside as road allowances, living very much on the margins of society, but maintaining often that, that way of life. When I first came to do Métis archaeology, I was pretty early on in my uh, time here at the University of Alberta. I've been here since about 2010. I was looking for some other directions to take in my research, and I started to delve into Métis archaeology. There's been very little done uh, on our history, and what had been done really focused on classifying and categorizing our material culture, testing to see if it was more like European or First Nations, and then coming up with interpretations of our material culture based on a very specific understanding of sort of creolization or hybridity. It was looking at our mixedness. I found this deeply dissatisfying because it was really only looking at our archeology span in a lens to those other two categories, First Nations and European. And I was like, well, what about Métis archaeology? How can we understand Métis archaeology itself without having to constantly be talking about the hybridity of our material culture? And this really had me then reflecting on what do we actually do when we use a Western framework in archaeological research? Well, we take the material that we find and we put it into categories. Those categories are dependent on where you work in the world, what time period you work in, but inevitably, inevitably they go into something that usually is like that, like they're alike in some way. Material, right? You put all the stone tools together, all the, the points together in some way, all the points that look similar go together. And then we build taxonomies, we build ways of understanding their connection. This inherently separates them into these various categories. And then we'll run statistical analysis, we'll run various things to try to make sense of them. But fundamentally, it's based on taking them apart and putting them into these categories, removing them from the earth, and then finding ways to analyze them. The artifacts, as we call them, are treated as objects for study. They're measured, they're weighed, they're photographed, and then we produce knowledge based on our understandings of them. And then they're cared for or curated in very particular ways. You know, we write little numbers on them, we put them into bags, we put them into boxes, they go into a museum. This is the work of archaeology. But what does this actually mean when you're working in an Indigenous landscape and you don't want to necessarily match these things up based on what previous archaeologists have done. You don't want to put all the stone tools together. That might not actually make sense because fundamentally, Indigenous knowledge systems approach how knowledge is generated differently. And making space for that recognizes instead connection, relation, the interwoven nature of knowledge, this idea that it's not just humans who are alive. It's, it's the interconnections between humans and other than humans. And this can even include those ancestral places and those ancestors, very different conception of what that connection might look like. 
So when I approach the question of what would it mean to do Métis archaeology from a Métis perspective, I turn to our ways of knowing, our ways of understanding, and what could that possibly bring to the study of our material past using some of those archaeological methods. And this took me to the framework that I use when I'm doing Métis archaeology. So this is a image that helps to understand a few things. First of all, this is the picture of what's called a Métis sash, very important contemporary symbol of Métis communities today. It's a finger woven sash that would have been used by our ancestors for a variety of purposes, but part of it was a marker of who we are. And some families had their own patterns within the sash, for example. I really love the sash as a metaphor because it is only in the interweaving of those threads that a pattern emerges. And therefore, I think about the ways in which these different concepts, relations, mobility, geography, daily life, and economy connected to our Métis history can map on to say certain archeological data sets uh, or certain historical data sets, and then how we can weave those all together to get a much fuller understanding of our history. So the idea here is that while I pulled the threads out for now as different categories, you cannot understand one without understanding them all, that they must all be understood in relation. That's the only fundamental way to make sense. And the predominant color in the sash is red and the most core to an understanding of a Métis past and a Métis present is Métis relations. And this is both kin relations between humans and then relations to place, to animals, to waters, etc. So how does this then actually look? I have done other presentations where I've sort of pulled at each thread and talked a little bit about the ways in which I explore data. For example, mobility and geography, I've used GIS methods to try to see what's possible um, using GIS to understand that, but also seeing where the gaps are, where these tools that are often built within Western frameworks can't translate well into a lot of those Indigenous knowledge systems. And so we actually need new frameworks, we need new tools, we need new ways of, of bringing this knowledge into archaeology. So the place in which I've done a lot of work trying to you know, work through this model, thinking about the relations, is at Métis overwintering sites. Métis overwintering sites were places in the mid 19th century, so usually about 1840 to 1880, where large interconnected family groups of Métis would go out onto the prairie away from the major settlements and build their own winter settlements in order to hunt bison over the winter. This particularly happened as bison herds were declining and they were getting harder to find near these major settlements. And so therefore setting up camp closer to where the bison were in the winter would allow for provisioning and the winter hunting, um, you know, furs in the winter were, were very prized, et cetera. So these were places to, to stage those hunts uh, and to spend the winters together. These would be large collections of, of Métis families uh, up to as many as, you know, as few as you know, 10 to 20, but as many as a couple hundred Métis families kind of together in these places. They are archaeologically interesting because they are quite distinctly Métis. Uh, many of the other places that we were living, there's less um, clarity about you know, where the Métis folks were, where the European folks were, where the First Nations people were. This removes some of that ambiguity and allows us to say, OK, what this is Métis material culture that we're seeing. What can it help us understand about these various threads? I'm just going to talk a little bit about one site. We've worked at a couple now, but the Chimney Coulee sites where we've done most of, of our work over the past few years. And this is a site that's really interesting. It's in southern Saskatchewan, not too far from the US border. It's in an area called the Cypress Hills, which is a really interesting ecological zone. Uh, it has quite a different um, flora than the surrounding areas because it was never glaciated and it's kind of a high sort of plateaued area. It's long been also a place where many Indigenous nations have used it in a variety of ways uh, and it has a, a complex kind of uh, colonial history as well. So the Timney Cooley site was a Métis wintering site and we know probably starting in the 1860s and all the way up to the late um, 1870s, early 1880s. But there were two other occupations during that time period here. There was a large um, 
multi-room cabin built by a Hudson's Bay Company trader for one winter when he recorded where he was and what he was doing. And uh, after he left, he decided the area was a bit too dangerous and then the uh, cabin was burned. We know where that is on the site. It's been uh, excavated in the past. Then there was also a Northwest Mounted Police post that was here for a couple of years, and we know where that is on the site as well. So the remainder of the site is the Métis wintering site. So these multiple occupations are interesting archaeologically as well, because it allows us to say, are there differences and similarities between these different occupations? And what might that tell us about Métis uh, family life? Because there were probably Métis folks with Isaac Howie and the Northwest Mounted Police, but probably not families. Um, so we we're mapping the site using non-invasive techniques uh, to help understand what's going on at the site without having to necessarily prioritize excavation first or to make our excavation very targeted. And this is often something that comes up in Indigenous communities around wanting to disturb as little as possible. And then we did do some excavation. Um, a lot of our, our Métis relatives are very excited about what archaeology can, can bring to an understanding. So there was generally a lot of support for excavation as well. And this is actually a picture from the uh, 1878, we think, of people at the site itself. So one of the things that we had done at this site is bring out the ground penetrating radar because it can sometimes give us hints about things that are happening under the surface if we you know, use the right interpretations and, and can narrow down options. In this case, we used um, a high frequency ground penetrating radar, much higher frequency than we'd use for unmarked graves work or typical archeological work. And this allowed us to get a lot of detail in the very top part um, of the, the site, so the top half meter, which is where the Métis occupation is. And we actually were able to detect the, well, we thought we had detected the walls of the cabin. And so once we had um, found what we thought were the walls in the ground penetrating radar data, we put down a excavation unit to see if the wall was there. And the wall was quite clearly there. How do we know? Well, we were able to see these um, linear wooden trenches. These would have been log cabins. They would have been uh, mudded on the inside and the outside with uh, local material to, to seal them in for the winter time. And most of the logs would have been removed and repurposed, but the bottom one clearly was left to decay. And we can actually catch that trench and so when we put down that unit and came across a linear trench that had a bunch of wood pieces in it, we we're pretty clear that we found the wall. And we also think that we actually found the clay from the outside of the cabin, the mud that had slid down and it creates a different reflection um, in the ground penetrating radar data as well. So it's very exciting to get some of these results. Now, another really important part of doing Métis archaeology is you know, what are the materials that we find when we do archaeological research with Métis folks? Well, a lot of it is similar to what we might find in other uh, sites of the same era. So lots of you know, kitchen materials, ceramics, we find metal bits, we find nails, um, we find lots of bone, animal bone, so lots of bison, for example, bone. We also find, if we're looking for them, beads, thousands of beads. So Métis women known for exquisite floral beadwork patterns in the past, in the present. This is an important part of our traditional ways and our, our artistic practices. So in these cabins in the winter, these women were beading with these tiny drawn glass seed beads ranging from you know a half millimeter all the way up to about three millimeters in diameter very, very tiny. So we have to design our methods to find them because otherwise they would fall through our screens, for example. So when we do design our recovery methods to recover them, they are by far the dominant artifact category at every Métis site. So they show in many ways our presence there. Almost all the time we find individual beads. We'll find, you know, someone, a beater has dropped it into the dirt floor, never to be recovered again. But occasionally we see something a little bit different. So at Chimney Coulee in the summer of 2017, my graduate student came across this beadwork pattern. So it's just a small piece. It's a flower bud. 
Um, so it's representation, probably part of a larger piece. We don't know what exactly, we don't know what it was on, um, but we were able to extract it by um, cutting basically a square of soil, very carefully removing it and then solidifying the soil around it. And so this was a really wonderful example of sort of that Métis beading practice. And we see similar types of patterns on um, Métis beadwork and embroidery work from the same era in that ethnographic collections. But with this particular piece, something really important happened. When I was preserving it using the compounds and various things needed to be in a lab, we needed a fume hood, you know, to, to deal with all of this. And I started getting a strong sense that something wasn't quite right, that it was not happy being in this very sterile lab. And this had me reflecting on Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous relationality, and in particular, one that's connected to my own knowledge systems, and that is the concept of Wakotuin. So Wakotuin is a Cree word, um, but very prevalent in, in Métis communities as well, and the words up here are actually from Métis elder Maria Campbell. And Wakotuin is best described as a concept, a law, and a practice. As a concept, it tends to be tr um, translated as good relations, being in good relations, all my relations, but it's not just a word, it's also a way of being. So this particular concept is informs practice, informs how as Cree and Métis people we go about being in the world. And in particular, it's about being a good relation in a reciprocal and responsible way. So respecting the relationships that we have and the responsibilities that we have that stem from those relations to care for those relations. So what this helped me understand, this beautiful piece of beadwork, this remarkable archeological find is not an object to be measured and studied and put into you know, an institution somewhere. It is in fact my relation. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean that quite literally. It's part of my complex web of relations. And that includes living kin, that includes ancestors, that includes these places. And that it is my responsibility as a relation to care for and to visit with this relation. And that means it sits with medicines. It sits in a protected place. You know, We do want to, to preserve it in our own way. And it's also really sparked me to think about what does it mean to care? Right? What would it mean for Métis people to be able to enact our own sense of care over our relations? And how would that potentially look different than how our belongings are cared for by institutions right now? So it really opened up all of these possibilities for me and is really changing my relation to archaeology as a practice and, and understanding my own connection with these, these places and these ancestors. And now when my uh, living Métis kin come to visit me at the university, I'll bring out the speedwork and we'll visit with it. We'll have tea and we'll, you know, build Wakotuin. So this is, you know, that example for me really gets at the heart of, you know, what is Indigenous knowledge? How can we, as Métis people, tell our own story? How do we bring that forward? But as I've worked with communities over the past 15 years or so, there's something that has always come up. And the more I work closely with communities, the more this comes up. And these are knowledge about places on the landscape where there are likely to have been burials. Some of these are historic cemeteries, which no longer have the markers or don't have fencing. Um, other times there are places where uh, people have been dispossessed, but they know generally where those practices used to occur and that's been passed on. And therefore, I uh, have been using ground penetrating radar and other techniques to support communities see if we can find those potential graves um, for a number of years now. Obviously, this has become even more important over the past eight or nine months since Dikamlu Pishwatmek had released their results from some GPR work that was done there. But I, and I won't be talking about specific re residential school examples today. Uh, I will mention it briefly, but it's highly sensitive and not something that we can necessarily 
put out in these these fora without communities really wanting them to be done in that way. But I will talk about the method. And it's very, very similar, the approach that we're taking in these other places. So I'm going to talk instead about a partnership with my own um, community, so Papa's Chase First Nation, to explore an area in Edmonton that had been brought up as an area of concern by community members and elders because there was knowledge of there having been potentially a burial ground in this area. The historical record supports this. There's uh, little records talking about a bunch of white crosses or that this was the, the Indian, Indian burial ground. Uh, and, but we weren't exactly sure exactly where it was. So what ground penetrating radar can sometimes do is help to provide more possible locations where, where these graves might be narrowed down the possibilities. The area of interest in this case was in the city of Edmonton, and it was behind what is a, um, a Baptist college that was established on that, that site in the, in the 60s, and you know long after the dispossession had in fact happened. But because of the history of the fact it was a college, there was a large open area behind it. And unlike a lot of the other area around, which had been developed, this hadn't been as developed. It was in the process of potentially being developed. So the community came to us and said, can you, can we, you know, at least see if there's anything here before, uh, you know, before the development happens. So we brought out the ground penetrating radar and another method, magnetic radiometry, you know, looking for potential um, shafts of grades. So ground penetrating radar looks for anomalies uh, under the surface. Then we try to eliminate uh, other possibilities for those anomalies, such as pipes or tree roots or rodent burrows. And then if we can see certain characteristics in those anomalies that we find in graves, in like known cemeteries, et cetera, over known graves, then we can start to build our confidence that we might be finding graves. We never be 100% sure with GPR. Uh, we don't see bodies. We can't confirm that there's, uh, you know, remains in any particular location. We can narrow down possible locations though. So we went out here and we did a number of days of survey with the field school from the university. And interestingly, the area in the field was pretty empty on the GPR. So it was you know, relatively homogenous. We didn't see a lot of anomalies. It looked like there had been quite a history of disturbance to make it quite so even, but no traces of potential graves in those areas. However, in an area adjacent, this area uh, sort of on the northwest, oh, sorry, southwest corner, right near the creek, there's this white mud creek, sorry, black mud creek that goes here. In this little patch here, we did get some potential results. So this particular area, really close to the tree line, um, and it was also close to water. And we believe this was likely um, a burial that happened in the mid late 1800s, probably a combination of Christian and traditional practices. And one traditional Cree practice is to bury people on a high up location near water. The bank is extremely steep here. So this is high above the water. And uh, we had some results, uh, some possible uh, graves here. So we were able to interpret potentially three locations that could be burials uh, that had characteristics that we associate with burials from other places and on the GPR. And then we also had in one case a hit from the magnetometer as well, which likely represents a potential metallic object. If it is a, a burial, then it could be something in that burial. We cannot tell for sure based on that, but something that had a very strong um, signal on the magnetic radiometer, which most likely is, is a metal. And it was at about the same depth as we saw the actual pit itself. It only crossed a short area, so it wasn't a pipe or anything else. It was quite discreet. So these were results that possibly this was the, the burial area that had been brought up in community and indicated in the historical record. And there's nothing left of it today that you couldn't tell from the surface at all. So we're working with Papas Chase and the city of Edmonton to explore what's next. Um, there could potentially be more anomalies nearby, but they're under the forest cover. So much harder to detect with GPR. And we're looking at possibilities of protecting the area, um, using other methods to help confirm. 
uh, and monitoring the, the bank in case there's anything untoward um, uh, coming out of it as well if this was the, the burial location. And then there's other areas that the community has concerns about in the city as well. So working with the community to explore where else the GPR might be useful to at least have a look and see what's going on. And this, of course, has led me to working with a number of different nations to use ground penetrating radar and other uh, various technologies to help to potentially bring some specific locations where children who never came home from residential school could have been buried. Um, we know that over 150,000 Indigenous children were forced to attend these institutions, and we already know that thousands never came home. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation has 4,130 names on a memorial register where at least two um, independent documents have confirmed that a child died at the school. Many parents were never notified of their children's deaths, and there were almost were very few examples of those children being sent home if they were from far away. And in many cases, children were. The children from multiple nations attending one institution, sometimes from two or 3,000 kilometers, so you know, 1,500 miles away. Graves are not always known. Um, some of them may have been in large community cemeteries uh, where there aren't currently any markers. There's no sort of permanent headstones. There may have been markers in the past, but they're no longer there, so we don't know who's where. And then, you know, survivors also share testimonies about seeing and hearing things, which suggests there could be, uh, there could be graves elsewhere. So the search is underway across the country to start the process of exploring possible locations for some of these graves using these technologies. Again, we cannot be 100% sure in most cases that they are graves, but we can definitely narrow down potential areas that warrant further investigation. And in, you know, this is, archaeologists have become involved in this. We sit at a place where we have a knowledge of the technology. We, many of our colleagues now work with Indigenous communities, um, also have an understanding about how to develop an approach to this, this work that um, develops sort of a research plan, um, how to narrow things down, how to make sense of the archive, how to connect all these pieces together. And so this really has become a large focus of my own work. And this is a very clear connection to restorative justice. There's a sense that, you know, while there's knowledge that these institutions existed, there's not really been yet a sense of accountability for what happened to the children, both those who survived and those who didn't. And the conditions in these schools were often horrific. People even at the time were talking about how horrific they were, but no one's really ever been held accountable for this. And so this really has an eye toward restorative justice. Archaeology can't bring all the answers. It's not the nature of our work. It's always got ambiguity and uncertainty, but we can help to narrow things down and we can help to make sense of where uh, some of these answers might be found in the future. So just to summarize, uh, and then I'll uh, open up the floor for some conversation, you know, a lot of the work that I do now, I very much frame as archaeologies that matter to people other than archaeologists. They still matter to archaeologists as well, but the idea is, is that there's ways to use the techniques and the practices to address other important questions and you know, not just questions of Indigenous communities. There's lots of other important questions out in the world that archaeology can help uh, to support when it's done in a different way than it has been before. So working with communities, working to change the practice and the way of policy and regulation uh, force certain types of archaeological practice to take place. Um, I work a lot on Indigenous heritage and, and the interconnectedness even of heritage categories that, you know, the, the belongings can't be separated from the land, it can't be separated from the story, that in an Indigenous heritage context, those are all interconnected. And then really committing to this question of restorative justice. So the image here is from this week, it's from Tuesday where we announced some uh, potential graves located near the Gurard mission um, and with here in Alberta. So where my own family, uh, parts of my family called home. And we um, did this large press conference just on Tuesday of this week. So this work is very much uh, an ongoing process and, and we certainly don't have any clear definitive answers just yet, but the, the process is ongoing to really investigate these locations and learn more. 
So I want to say hi, hi, thank you for listening. And also um, thank you to all those folks who work with me and alongside me. Uh, I'm really lucky to have um, amazing community collaborators and amazing students and scholarly communities um, to help support this work. So hi, hi, thank you for listening. And I'm happy to take some questions. Wonderful, thank you so much for that um, very enlightening talk. Um, while you take a moment to, to hydrate, I would like to invite all of our participants to consider if they have any questions or comments uh, that they would like to ask our speaker. Please remember to use the question and answer um, tab on your, on your, at the bottom of your screen to send those questions over to us. While we wait for those, um, I think we have a question. It looks like a comment. But <laughs> okay, well, I, I'm trying to find it. It disappeared on me. Oh, okay. It's a comment. It is from from one of our faculty. So thank you for your talk and your co-edited volume, which ASC students and faculty are talking about at length amazing um thank you <laughs> wonderful <laughs> um i was re reading that you're uh, oh there's a question so could you speculate as to how universal narratives and human evolution harm indigenous communities especially in african nations and tanzania over 100 indigenous communities are nationally um, recognized um, I realize this is not your expertise, but I'm curious about your thoughts. I think this is a really important question, and you're right, I don't work in, in countries in Africa, I don't work with African communities, and I know even there's tension around the term Indigenous, depending on where you are. Um, at the same time, I think that a lot of the grand narratives, uh, because of the nature of how they uh, create these large narratives that aren't attentive to particular ways of knowing and being have a real tendency to uh, to do that kind of harm. I think in, in African countries in particular, there's been this because we're so um, interested, you know, this idea that folks from European countries are really interested in studying human evolution using paleoanthropology, et cetera. It has led to a very extractive model or focusing on a research question that maybe isn't actually that relevant to Indigenous communities today. Not that they're uninterested in it, but it may not be the highest priority. And so the history of how paleoanthropology and archaeology have been done, maybe have not been as attentive to what those needs of those communities might be, what their interests might be. Uh, and then anytime there's a grand narrative, even if that grand narrative is sort of challenging some of these broader ones, I won't go into this in too much detail, and I haven't actually finished the book, but I, I was I started the dawn of everything, and even in that, the way that indigenous the indigenous critique and indigenous communities from the northwest coast are represented, it's so high level and so um, it can't do justice to the complexity, right? These grand narratives just never can do justice to the complexity of lived experience, and therefore they inevitably gloss over that, and that can often do harm because it. It impacts our perception of those communities, right? So people are reading about this and they're they're coming to conclusions about those societies based on these very simplified, very high level interpretations. So I guess that's what I would say on, on that question. As we wait for more questions, I um, wanted to point um, I was recently reading this piece that that you all published. Let me see the 2019 piece. Um, what are the prospects for archaeology of the heart um, in, uh, I believe, the SAA archaeological record? And um, I, one of the things you know, when I was reading your sort of descriptions, you talked about them today as well. The four, the four chambers, um, the your description of rigor, I thought, uh, really refreshing, right? We hear that word often in academia, but I, I appreciated that the first was that it emphasizes integrity in our research process, which I, you know, is not necessarily the first that comes to mind um, when I think of the way rigor is sort of 
deployed as a way to uh, how to how to phrase it sort of to dismiss or to um, uh, delegitimize the ways of knowing of other communities, right? Oftentimes, I feel like uh, rigor is used as sort of a dog whistle to say, you know, if it doesn't fit this very specific sort of empiricist objective, whatever narrative of of research, then it's it's not really research. It's not to be trusted. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm interested to just to hear if you have a couple of moments just to talk a little bit about um, how you and your you know co-authors on that piece decided to or came up with that definition of rigor and why um, you know obviously that aspect that you're talking about is important and I'm at um, you know why it was one of the four chambers but how that was the definition of rigor specifically I don't know it, it, it seems like a random question but it just caught my attention yeah. when I was reading and I think you're, you're right in that it often gets used as that sort of dog was well is it rigorous it's like well what did, what do you mean by rigorous and by whose standards. And often it gets interchanged with validity, which I think is where you know, we, um, we want to distinguish those, those concepts. And we drew certainly also on sort of philosophy and Sandra Harding and some of these sorts of um, uh, work around you know, this idea that we can still do good work while recognizing our uh, standpoints, right? Sort of strong objectivity. I don't love the term objectivity either, but at the same time, there is this idea that we can still look at the information that we have and look at what it's saying, but that integrity is really important. And not all rigorous work necessarily has integrity, I would argue, and that those aren't necessarily the same thing either. So if we want to bring that kind of ethic, of we're going to do the best we can with the information that we have. We're not going to overstate or understate our results. Um, and we're going to understand what's possible within that that system. That is integrity. The other really important part for us was that science isn't the only rigorous way of knowing. All ways of knowing have rigor. They're just how you define those evaluative criteria differ, right? What constitutes knowledge differs and needs to be evaluated on its own understanding of, of rigor and not some external one, right? And so that's really, I think, where we were coming from with that. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for explaining that. Okay, so we have a question here that says, does it become more difficult to identify unmarked graves after decades have passed? Do graves look different on GPR if they were dug 70 years ago as opposed to 5, 10, or 20 years ago? No, this is an important question. And the answer is it really varies. It really varies on the environmental conditions, right? So the type of soil, uh, the type of environment in which they were buried, the way in which that they, they were buried. I would say that in most cases, something that was five years ago and seven years ago may look somewhat different, but we do have a pretty broad suite of evidence suggesting that we can detect graves in the right conditions from 100 potentially even 150 years ago if the soil conditions are correct and there's multiple ways in which we do it so it's not just one singular trait we're looking for sometimes we'll more clearly see a disruption in say the um, the soil so there'll be the soil will be you know relatively uniform and then you'll see something that disrupts it that matches you know the width uh, and length that we might expect a grave to be Obviously, there's variability in that, but we can have some general ways of understanding it. Other times, we'll catch the bottom of the grave shaft where it will reflect. So over time, sometimes those edges may become less clear because of you know, erosion, because of water, depending on the environment. Uh, but usually, they don't disappear entirely. So unless something, and there can be reasons that we don't see them in GPR. Um, and certainly, I've been in cases where even where you expect graves to be, they're not easily seen but usually that's because of the soil conditions of some kind that just mean that the signal doesn't bounce back uh, and so clay soils tend to absorb the, uh, the the electromagnetic wave and they don't ever bounce it back so if you're in an area that has a ton of clay it can be tricky uh, to to find those anomalies so time is an important variable something we have to consider but soil and the environmental conditions are also a very important variable to consider. And in some um, environments, you can see 100 and 150 year old graves relatively easily. In others, you couldn't even see 20 year old graves. So it really depends. Um, so shifting a little bit, um, there's, I can try to pronounce this, but perhaps if you know how to pronounce this term, um, you might be better than me. Um, 
it says thank you, KCUU. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Keisha, for all of the work that you do. Can you describe how we can support your work in our own areas? Further, can you provide some recommendations on what you envision for opening the discipline of archaeology to braiding indigenous knowledges to enhance our shared knowledge of the past? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Aura. I'm glad you were here. Um, good, good to have you in the audience today. I mean, I think the work of the the unmarked graves, um, or is in particular right now, is on a lot of people's minds. And of course, this is not unique to Canada. Other colonial places, such as the United States and Australia and, and others, had very similar institutions. And we even see it in other places where, particularly a British colonial and, and the churches were involved. Um, these types of institutions uh, it certainly occurred. I really hope to see a more coordinated attention to this in the United States. We had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, which spent years and huge amounts of resources to bring those witnesses, to, um, those um, survivors together to be witnessed, to have their testimony witnessed, and also to bring in a huge amount of archival material. And so we're starting from a different place in Canada. And I really hope that in the United States, more of that can happen. I think raising awareness. Um, I think the way that the media tends to report on things can sometimes lead to lack of clarity in what it is we're actually doing. And so especially archaeologists who can help to just provide um, through translation of how things might be reported, I think it's becoming really important. Uh, you know, a lot of the initial work out of, of Kamloops was not being reported in a way that really reflected the work that was done. And that's led to some less than ideal outcomes for the community uh, and some suspicion of the use even of some of the technologies. And so I think as long as we're clear about what we can and cannot know, and archaeologists certainly have a role, indigenous and non-indigenous archaeologists, to help to continue to narrate that. Um, and so if you have a place or a platform where you can engage in those ways, it can be very valuable. And in terms of making space for braiding Indigenous knowledges, you know, I think there's been a lot of conversation around the ways in which these sort of Western ways of knowing and, and these Indigenous ways of knowing can really work together. Uh, and for me, in the work that I'm doing, that weaving, so it's not braiding exactly, but very similar ideas, is that, you know, I, I pull into each of those threads certain types of knowledge generation. So, for example, mobility. I'll use GIS to explore mobility, but I'll also use our oral history, and I'll also use the archival record and these historic maps. And so bringing those all into that thread allow me to kind of weave it into to the narrative. Uh, and I think there's a couple of things that obviously we can do. One is pedagogy, so important, right? Every archaeologist comes to who's a professional archaeologist in whatever capacity, CRM, museums, government, uh, academia, TIPOs, et cetera tend to go through some sort of post-secondary training. And those post-secondary training often really sets out what is the discipline of archeology. span And so when we can start there creating space for archeology span as a way of knowing the past in these particular ways, and that indigenous knowledge can inform and engage with that, sometimes it'll be contradictory, sometimes they'll be similar, but starting that from the beginning, I think makes a big difference. And then supporting our colleagues on their, their journeys of, of learning, supporting more Indigenous uh, scholars, right, makes a big difference. And not only represent, like, rep, not just representation, but actually supporting Indigenous scholars to do the type of scholarship they want to do, which is not the same thing as putting them into positions, right? It's creating the environments for our knowledge systems to come into these spaces, to not be told that they're not real archaeology or that we shouldn't be doing these things. Uh, and that's so important because you still find those moments of tension where it's like, well, is that real archaeology? And I'm saying, well, who defines what real archaeology is? That's what we do as a collective. And the type of archaeology I do is real archaeology, but it also is an archaeology that is expansive. It's not one that cuts off these bound, these arbitrary boundaries. It says, let's explore all the different ways in which we can know the past. So that's sort of my approach to, to that. I have a couple more questions there, but I, I kind of I actually had a quick follow-up to, to what you were just talking about, a follow-up question. So um, my question is around you know, you spent some a good amount of time in your talk talking about the importance of sort of, um, I, I don't know that you see, the interconnectedness, right, of all of the different uh, sort of ways of knowing, different um, ways of being. 
um, within a particular context of uh, Métis specifically. And my question in relation to this question that you just answered is, um, you know, as I love the idea, right, of opening up and bringing in sort of different ways of knowing. But then my concern, or I guess my question for you is, how do we ensure that what's happening doesn't lose its context, right? So that we're not just picking up certain sort of ways of knowing, et cetera, from different indigenous knowledge systems without having sort of the context, the situatedness, and then try to sort of applying them in places that don't make sense or that are not, you know what I mean? Um, I, I don't know, know if I asked that question. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> Uh, and okay. I think this is, again, coming back to the earlier question about these grand narratives, it's the same issue with grand theory. You know, relational ontology is a fundamental to Indigenous ways of life, but a lot of non-Indigenous archaeologists come to it through Western theorists who extracted it and appropriated it from Indigenous ways of life. And so for me, I gave a talk, oh goodness, it was like a year and a half ago now, and I'm working on a paper on it called relationality is not a metaphor. Pulling off, if anyone's familiar with Peck and Yang's decolonization is not a metaphor. For me, relationality is not an abstract. It is not a, like sort of just something I, I theorize. It is what I literally live in my day-to-day -day life. And I must live it because it is part of that lived experience. And so I think we have to be very careful around, you know, some of those teachings might be something that can be used to inform uh, other approaches. And there's a lot of interconnection, like Wakotuin is not, it is a Cree term, but it's not the only term in Indigenous language that means that many Indigenous languages have their own way of framing a very similar concept. So there is connection and we can draw a connection across that, but I think it needs to one be Indigenous led. Right. So if we are going to find those connections, let Indigenous scholars do it and then cite them, <laughs> draw on them. But also recognizing that Wakotwin is not going as a concept is not applicable everywhere. And it shouldn't be, right? And it needs, it has its own situatedness uh, that lives in particular places and particular sets of relations and can't just sort of be picked up and put elsewhere. And the other thing that it, it does. And this is one thing I'm really exploring right now with my knowledge holders and elders is it invites us to even categorize things in a very different way. So I'm working on building a database that one side will have to maintain an archaeological database because that's sort of what it will do. But I want to create a community facing database that organizes things differently. So as opposed to putting like all the, you know, things of a particular material in a box, I'm actually asking my knowledge holders, well, how do we organize this? What makes sense in our way? Maybe we want to put this thing and this thing together because they're, the language relates them in a particular way. Or we want to put this and this together because they were both used by a particular person, right? Or the, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm exploring that. Because even the fundamental ways in which we put things together uh, changes when we bring those in. But a Métis model for that can't be picked up and put somewhere else because that those knowledge holders need to define what that is in their own context. Okay, so we have, thank you. Um, we have another question here from one of our faculty uh, members, Magdalena. She says, do you know of initiatives designed to give a transnational voice to indigenous people's views of anthropological archeological research in the Americas? This is a really important question and there has definitely been, an, been a, a very valid critique that a lot of uh, indigenous archeology, span for example, has drawn largely from the global north and from English speaking uh, contexts. And I think there's more work to do to build connection across um, multiple nations, certainly in the Americas, but also across the world with much more attention to the issues that are happening in the, in the global south. I think we're seeing more scholarship in, in those ways. In terms of initiatives, I think there's lots of possibilities that we can envision. I know, for example, there's been the Indigenous Archaeology Collective that has emerged, um, you know, right now more centered in the US, but I think we could probably imagine ways to expand our networks and to work together um, to help to see what, again, those similarities are, but also what those specific histories might be. You know, Métis history is very specific, not there aren't Métis people in other places, but there may be similar types of communities in other places where we could share. So I don't have any answers necessarily, but an invitation, I guess, to uh, imagine what that could look like, because I think we are stronger when we collaborate and we work together and we support one another to push back against some of these structures in which we engage. 
Okay, we have another question that says, um, thank you for your excellent talk. Could you expand more on how you envision archaeologists can discuss emotion in the distant past, particularly in contexts such as journal articles? Yeah, so thank you so much for that. And I, if you haven't had a chance to, the kind of second half of Archaeologies of the Heart is a series of case studies from different contexts, engaging with different kinds of archaeology, um, exploring emotion in particular. Uh, and then there's um, also the emotive project, and there's a lot of inspiration there. But I think one is to ask the question, right? So we can't see things that we don't ask the questions about, right? So there's a reason that we see certain types of um, interpretations sort of repeating themselves is because people are asking similar types of questions. So first question, what could emotion bring, like what can we understand about emotion from material culture? I mean, burials are the most clearly connected. So if you, you are in a, a place where you're seeing or studying um, burial contexts that often can be quite evocative of emotion. Um, one of the chapters in, in the book is by Jane Baxter who does childhood. And that's another place where emotion can often emerge. But my favorite, uh, I mean, they're all wonderful, but my, one of my favorite chapters is Leslie Van Gelder's work. She works in caves, in painted caves in, in Europe, in sort of Upper Paleolithic Europe. But she doesn't study the paintings. She studies the marks of fingers and hands on the walls of the caves. So these, and what they show are relations between families, that there's, like there's ones of children, you can tell the size of fingers, and there's children, and clearly a child that's being held. Right, because the the uh, the height of those fingers show someone on, on a mother or father's hip, right, running their fingers along the walls, and for me that is just so evocative of relation and emotion and connection, that I think it can it, it really brings brings it home in a beautiful way. So you know sometimes materiality can bring that, sometimes context can bring that, and also I think um, the more those of us who do this work end up, I'm currently. Um, an associate editor for American Anthropologist. And that's a you know, very prominent journal. And myself and Uzma Rizvi do that work. And we would welcome papers that engage in this. And so more of us who sit on those editorial sides can also work to make space. And our editorial collective, which Elizabeth Chin has kind of curated and created for us, is very committed to changing the process of what it means to apply, like to send your, your article in, what reviewing looks like, if someone comes back with a really disrespectful review, they probably won't be asked to review again because there's ways to do constructive critique that aren't diminishing or demeaning to the author, right? And so we're inviting a different way of approaching that. So I think in terms of the, the, first, the first part of the question, how do we understand emotion in the past? It's a question we need to ask. And there's probably lots of possibilities that we don't even understand yet. But the second is journals need to do a better job of creating space for that and inviting that type of work. Absolutely. Hey, um, we still have about five more minutes. So if there are any more questions, I urge you all to, to submit them. Um, I, as, as um, and you know, if, if that's not something that you would like to talk about, feel free not to, but I did have a question. I'm not particularly familiar, um, um, you know, prior to your talk of the Métis um, nation in Canada. And my question um, is around some of the, were the, the policies towards, uh, from the government um, uh, towards the Métis nation um, in things such as sort of residential schooling, um, the same between uh, um, First Nations and Métis communities or were they slightly different or how, how were they perceived, I guess, as um, different or, or not by the government? So they, they definitely were different. And so early on the government, in the government of Canada, they passed the Indian Act, still called the Indian Act today, uh, 1876, it was passed. And it clearly defined that Indian people by which they mean First Nations status, uh, status Indians were the government's sort of responsibility, meaning that you know the government set up reserves and defined law and policy around that, was able to enact the residential school system, created something called the pass system where you couldn't leave the reserve without a pass. So the, that was all done by the federal government. Métis folks, because of the script that I mentioned, so basically Métis script was supposed to be the government solution to the Métis problem. So as opposed to legislating the Métis Act, 
um, they did script and script was supposed to it provided either land. Um, so X number of acres or it provided money uh, and the system was not designed to really address the issue It was more so to be like oh look we dealt with that. Most Métis didn't end up with land, even if they got land for scrip, it was there's speculators waiting outside the door to buy it or they had to go to one place and then go to another place and then move somewhere completely different than their homeland to take it up. So that led to widespread dispossession and then also sort of different uh, patterns of, of settlement. And so the Métis were always kind of, we were always kind of in the cracks. So the, some of the provinces did stuff um, in Alberta, where I am, we have some settlements which are Métis, kind of a Métis land base the only place in Canada that we have a land base. And some, some Métis children did go to residential school, but the Indian agents didn't show up on the, to, the, to the every settlement and take children, right? They didn't force all Métis children to go to those schools in the way that uh, they did for First Nations. At the same time, I mentioned that I, I did this press conference this week, in the records of that, that parish and in that school are my Métis relatives. And at, at the height of that school, about 50% of the students were Métis and students died there and they were abused there. Um, but we haven't had the same engagement with uh, like the, the TRC process. Uh, and even now there's, um, there's less consideration of what the Métis experience was at many of these residential schools. So it's still a conversation we're having. And this is the problem when it's the colonial government who decides who we belong to and what categories we belong to. Because the way that we divide up First Nations and Métis does not reflect our relationality. I have, again, like brothers and sisters in the same family, some are status and some are Métis. It really depended on where you were, whether or not you needed the money right away, whether or not, you know, where, who you were married to. But then here's the, the line, you either have to be X or Y. You can't be status and Métis, you have to be status or and dividing, right? This, this sort of taxonomies still impact even our relations today. Thank you for that clarification. Um, okay, so we're almost right up on time. Um, I know we started a few minutes late, but we don't have um, any more questions in the Q&A, so um, we won't keep you. Thank you so much for coming and um, giving this incredible talk. Um, you know, I'm sure as everybody else here, I look forward to learning more about the continued, you know, uh, restorative justice work that you're doing in Canada. And um, everyone, thank you all for joining us. I apologize for the earlier technical difficulties that got us started off a little bit late. Um, and I hope that you all can join us for our um, last talk for, of the series on April 28th with uh, Dr. John Rosa, um, Jonathan Rosa. And um, again, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day.